Vlado Bosanac had a rough upbringing and he left school early for the working world. From stationary salesman to lawnmower to property developer to bodybuilder, he's taken an unusual and inspiring route. As CEO and chairman of Advanced Human Imaging, Vlado oversees an impressive array of smartphone based human scanning technologies with applications in fitness, M Health, life and health insurance, and apparel. You'll find the technology embedded across many partner apps. The company takes privacy and security very seriously, as well they should. Advanced Human Imaging is expanding in the US from its base in Australia, and I'm excited to welcome Vlado when he arrives in Boston. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps healthcare technology companies like Advanced Human Imaging develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me at dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. And finally, please do me a favor and subscribe to the podcast. Well, Vlado Bozanak, CEO of Advanced Human Imaging, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks, David. Great to be here. You know, sometimes I, I'm doing uh, interviews with people that are making some new form of drug, and I can't even understand what the heck the thing is going to do. And I don't have whatever illness it is, so I don't care that much about it. But yours is endlessly visual, so we're going to have plenty to talk about. And I'll ask, I don't know if I'll ask intelligent questions, but at least I have some idea of what I want to ask. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll do my best to give you intelligent answers. How's that? That sounds good. So let's talk about how you got here and maybe winding it back to the beginning a bit. Uh, what's your background? What was your childhood like? Any any big influences? You know, I, I'd like to come up with some really impressive story about my childhood. But listen, I'm, I'm from a, a broken home. My mother was on a supporting mother's pension from the government uh, to put my brother and I through school. And um, we went to a public school in a very rough area. And it was the, the kind of area that... Um, you, if you didn't fight well, you didn't survive. So I'd love to say I went to an Ivy League school and all these wonderful things, but, th th you know, I came from the school of hard knocks where mum just taught us good values and, um, you know, good principles in life. And, and we, we chose our direction and my brother's been um, in, in one job his entire life and it, I, I think he's far more successful than I am. And I've navigated this road of startups and venture capital and private investment um, since I was very, very young uh, to end up where I am today. So I, I don't have some illustrious story of uh, my education and my upbringing that I can, I can swander through today, uh, but it was definitely interesting. It was definitely interesting. You know, I'll tell you what, you know, it's sort of like where you stand depends on, wh on where you sit. I was just having this conversation with my uh, youngest son who's 16 uh, years old and, and how, you know, he's like too soft. You know, it's like, uh, is, is my, my wife is like, you know, it's, it makes it too, too coddling for him. And it's like, how is he ever going to be tough enough to get out there and, and do anything? And, you know, it's good. It sounds like you got a good situation with your brother. You know, there's some other, there's some other examples here in Massachusetts. Uh, you, you may have heard of Whitey Bulger. He was an infamous uh, mafioso. His brother was the president of the Senate and the president of UMass Amherst. And he always had to deal with his brother, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, and, and Jimmy Carter too, he had a brother. So your brother sounds good. And it sounds like you actually, you know, had some early stimulus that would tell you what, uh, you know, what you want to do and what you want to stay away from. Uh, listen, absolutely. And I, I recall, um, you know, people say to me, what was the, the most motivational moment of your life? And I come from a European background. So it's super important that we know how to work with our hands, we're either bricklayers, cabinet makers, electricians, we, we do something with our hands. And my brother went straight into being an electrician um, and did a trade and an apprenticeship and got his way through and, and now works for a huge organisation. And um, I was this, this kid that didn't finish school and my biggest motivational speech was from my mother who she sat me down when I was about 15 and my brother had an apprenticeship and I'd left school to work in a health club and uh, she goes, well, son, even though you're never going to be successful, I'm always going to love you. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> it set the bar, right? I thought, oh, my God, I better make something of my life uh, because yeah. if I don't, everything she is going to come true, but she'll still love me, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like she had a lot of wisdom. We used to talk about with our, with our kids, you know, whatever you tell them would be the reverse. So I said, we don't need a psychologist here. We need a reverse psychologist. And it sounds like she maybe she had a good, like, motivational expectation for you anyway. So I'm sure she'd be proud of you. 
in any case, let's talk about, so then you left, you, you left school and then what, what sort of companies did you, did you work for? You know, like before you can put on like CEO and founder and Puba or whatever's, whatever's coming next, like what were some of the formative jobs along the way? Yeah, listen, I've always been, I've always been told I've got the gift of the gap. So I've always been someone that's been primarily in some sort of sales, because at the end of the day, when I looked at what my skills were and I wanted to earn a decent income and mum, as I said, was on a supporting mother's pension. So I thought I don't ever want to be on, on unemployment welfare benefits. I, I want to go and find a job. I want to do something and I always make sure that I can support uh, my family and things. So, um, you know, at a very young age, I remember pulling a, mow a lawnmower up the main road where I lived and mowing every second house's lawn on the odd days and on the evens, I do the others and I charge $10 to a front and a back lawn. And when I bought my first car, I bought it with cash because I mowed so many lawns. So I, I've always sort of been in things that gave me an opportunity to, to, to use my ability to communicate with people. And probably one of the real pivotal points in my life was there was a, a company looking for a commission-based only salesman to sell stationery. And yeah. Back in the day, you didn't have these big stationery stores everywhere. People would order it through companies and have it through, especially in the in the in the corporate and commercial sector. And you know, you didn't have the office works and uh, it's probably the WalMarts and things in in the US yeah, yeah. where where these big stores you know, sell the, these provisions. And um, I, I remember being given the business community, the CBD of Perth, as my my place to go. Well, the only place stationery stores really existed was in the city. So yeah. I was basically thrown into the oven to say, yeah, if this guy can make it here, he'll make it anywhere. Within a month, I was the highest paid person in the company. And within a year, I was the, uh, the, the highest achiever consistently across the life of the company. And uh, nice. I set myself up really well. And um, my father was a property developer in his uh, younger days. And um, Somehow I pivoted into that from the money I was making <laughs> yeah. on these commissions. I was going into small developments of, you know, just two bedroom units and things like that and uh, expanded that out to become, you know, quite successful doing condominium developments and, and so on. And it's funny how your life sort of shifts and pivots and you meet people and you see opportunities and, and how you want to work with those opportunities. Because I, I went from doing that to the property side of things and, the property market in the US, in Australia, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you have highs and you have lows. And you've got to work out what are you doing in those lows and hopefully you've made money and got out of some of it in the highs so you can do something in the lows. And um, it was in one of those lulls in the, in the property market where I'd been doing reasonably well and a lot of people around me were wanting to then co-invest in, in these opportunities. And when the market did tip and we had a, a little bit of property still that we were holding, with very little debt, we, we decided to start looking at some other opportunities, more of the capital markets. Yeah. So I ended up doing things around people that I knew that would, were making investments. And, you know, I, again, I, I'm not educated. I didn't go to university or college or any of these things. So I basically learned on the street and worked with guys that were really good at what they did. And, and I've always said this to my children, surround yourself with people that have skills or you admire because they're yeah. the people you're going to aspire to and you become better. I said, if you hang around with people that are less than you, you're going to be less than you are. So yeah. I've always surrounded myself with super smart people. And even in my company now, I get to be called CEO and chairman and all these wonderful names, but I'm not the smartest guy here. I'm not the smartest yeah. guy here by a country mile because I surround myself with guys that know how to build out my idea um, because I didn't know how to build it. Yeah, and so yeah. I grabbed the right people to do it and I'm surrounded by these fantastic people. And that's what I've done through my life. I've met people, done business with people. And I often talk about, you know, people in our day used to call you Rolodex. Well, these yeah. days it's your mobile yeah. phone. And I have 18,000 contacts in my mobile phone. And yeah. these are all people that I've shaken hands with and met somewhere in the world that has handed me a business card that I've then put into my, my database. So you talk about those six degrees of separation and I think that when you've been in this game for 30 years as I have and you get that many contacts, it's sort of like one or two degrees of separation to get to anything yeah. and anywhere. And, and I've just built on that by meeting yeah. people and opportunity. And really for the last 20 years, um, 18 of those years, I was in, in business with a, a partner of mine, Evan Cross, who was just a, 
a, a genius when it comes to accounting. He was a forensic accountant and, uh -huh. and deal. You know, he was. I was more of the deal uh, originator, but then when mm -hmm. it came to creating structure and and the process, that was his strength. So I, I learned that off him over over the eighteen years, and now I can not only originate the deal but execute on it. And that's what I've tended to do for the last probably seven or eight years until I founded this company that we have now, which you know has gone beautifully. It was an idea they had over a, a glass of wine and some great cheese in our wine region down south. And yeah. um, saw this concept being used by this uh, sports scientist in just tracking human movement through video, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, I'll adapt that to measurement. How valuable that would be! So I went from a, a little like light in the back of my head to a two hundred million dollar company today. So yeah, and it, by most people, they would say that's a success, right? Um, but it's a long way from where it's going to be, and uh, we've got some, some exciting stuff that I can't wait to tell you about. So good, good, good. I tend to get onto my. So I'm going to let you ask questions, and I'm going to answer them. Well, it was good. So you know, so so it's an interesting path. You know, sometimes part of the purpose of this podcast is to help people that are earlier stage of their career understand, you know, what's the what's the path you take if you want to become a, a CEO, founder, and and so on. Now, for some people, it's pretty straightforward, right? So I, I had one guy that I interviewed. His name is Michael Doctor. He's a doc. That was his name. Uh, he, his sister was sick with a GI issue when she grew up. He became, his family were like doctors uh, he became a doctor, a gastroenterologist. And then he went into something that has to do with that. And I'm like, well, that's pretty straightforward career path. Now I'm trying to figure out how you got off the, the rough streets and the lawn mowing and into the, uh, you know, into selling stationery. And then it's like less of a straight line, but it's interesting to hear sort of how your mind works and always taking opportunities, making the most of things, figuring out who you, you know, who you work with and how to get the most, uh, out of that to get you to a, to a pretty cool spot. So I like the, and, on the, and the wine and cheese, you know, that's always a good, uh, that's a good recommendation as well. So in the, in the proper region. So then we'll have to, we'll have to see if we can get a sponsorship from the, uh, the wine growing region there to say, look at, you know, it's more than just the beautiful grapes and, uh, experience and so on. All right. So advanced human imaging. So now what, what is the concept and, and what is this technology that you're dealing with? You know, when, when I approached the the concept of digital measurement, the company was originally called My Physique, and the reason for that was I was a competitive bodybuilder in my my younger days and heavily embedded in training and nutrition and taking care of myself and continually you know, being asked because I won many 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 championships. Yeah, um, I was asked all the time about you know how do you eat, how do you train, how do you do this, how do you do that. And when I was seeing this, this concept of videoing a athlete performing to then understand why they were injuring themselves, which was really a, a, a force versus, you know, action video captured so they could show them using an avatar why they were hurting themselves. I looked at that and I thought, geez, if you could get this, this same sort of technology to measure the human form, it would be a great way to self-appraise and be able to see if the changes you're after are happening. And that was that came from my deep understanding of training and wanting to understand how to be better and perform and understand if the change is happening and things. So that that was where that idea was born. But then he was a, a sports biomechanic and he, he said, I'm not a scientist and I'm definitely not a mathematician. But the guy that did this for me, I'll put you in touch with him and we, we met. And Dr. Amar is now with me eight years deep and still with me and um, a, an extremely smart and, and worthy gentleman of the role. He, the, the tech wouldn't be what it is today without his vision on how to actually pull this into a capability. Then I went the harder route because I thought, okay, maybe I can measure someone, but if how do they get to it? How do they use it? And, and I looked at that and I thought, well, everybody has a mobile phone. So if yeah. we could actually advance the algorithm to do this and deliver it via a mobile phone using a mobile phone camera, to me that would be the holy grail of you know privacy around this information and convenience. And being able to deliver it via someone's device means you don't have to buy another device. So we're breaking down multiple barriers at the same time and, and looking at it and how I initially wanted to launch this Let's not make no mistake, health and fitness and training and dieting and all that thing, 
it is driven by vanity. So yeah. I had zero resistance in my mind that someone would pay me $1 to check themselves with yeah. their own mobile phone. So that, that was the model I went after. It was, okay, we'll, we'll see if we can create this. And let me tell you, when we started it out, the idea was he said to me, give me $500,000 in six months and I'll, I'll give you something. Well, yeah. we're $30 million in now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have probably the most unique capturing suite sequence of technologies embedded through a mobile phone that you would find on the planet. I can put my hand on my heart and say at this point in time, we're not challenged by any yeah. other company in this space. We are the best at what yeah. we do. And um, what we've delivered is certainly unique. So when you deep dive into the company now and you, um, you introduced it as advanced human imaging. So we pivoted about a year ago right. with COVID and with all the functionality that we've built and we've added and licensed in and then the convergence of the, the data we put together and it's become so much more of a, a diagnostic tool than just something that measures someone's body. You know, if you yeah. look at our technology suite where we have the body scanning through the mobile phone, which simply gives you back 12,000 points of data capture across circumferences. So we uh -huh. do the core measurements, chest, waist, hips and thighs, and we give you back a body fat calculation that we have built from medical imaging that we've captured all over the world for a database to train to do that. So that's, that's how we started, and, and that's the core technology that is patented across every major jurisdiction in the globe, and we carry now you know, 54 patents to protect it from other people trying to do it the way we do it. Now, that doesn't mean other people aren't trying to do it, and that sure. doesn't mean there aren't people that can do it different ways. You know, I never, I never get concerned about competition. Competition is healthy, and let's face it, we're in a multi-trillion-dollar market, so I don't need a lot of that for this to yeah. be a glowing success for, for both myself and my shareholders. So it's been been a fantastic journey from that sense. And uh, we now, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Go on, you know, sorry, is it, is it the, that's okay. So the um, so what's interesting is you know a lot of people come up with something and then they put it in an app. Now, what you've done is actually make something that's more of like a software development kit that can be used in a lot of places. So it's not just even if somebody hasn't heard of your the company, even the previous you know name or the or the current one, they're going to see it in a lot of places. Where where have what was with that strategy as opposed to let's say just doing an app? And how what's the uptake been like? So you know that's a fantastic question because <clears throat> one of the reasons I went down a very different route on the way we deliver the technology is we're a B2B company. So you can't go on the app store and download our company's technology. It's not available. We we didn't want to take on the burden of you know consumer consumption. We didn't want to have to go out into the app stores and try to be seen amongst all the noise that's being created by every sort of app you could think of exists on the store. So what we've done is we've created a, a, a um, software development kit that all of our technology sits behind and we go to large organisations and you know, we have transactions signed with some great names. We've got Conor McGregor uh, signed to our brand that's going into the, the, um, the fast McGregor Fast platform. We've done a deal in the US with Photocracy, which was the, the number one fitness app for a number of years there. The same gentlemen are involved in Floyd Mayweather's application that is uh, going out with all of his gyms with uh, Mayweather Boxing and Fitness. We're, we're looking to be embedded there. Uh, Burn down in um, San Diego is a huge platform, 56 million uh, registered wow. users. And um, they, they need our data to be able to give the best possible data and health outcomes back to their consumers. So that's where you get our app. Or you might be with an insurer that's using our technology in their rewards programs through a, a Vitality or somebody like that where they reward you for sharing your data on your health activities such as your, your walking, your weight loss, your weight gain, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, all of this data. Because when they can capture that data, they can truly look after you. So we provide that data through our application. And that's what I was getting to earlier. We've got the body scan. We also have a transdermal facial scan that does blood pressure, respiratory rate, irregular heart rate, and, and um, your, your standard, your, your stable heart rate. So you've got the major vital signs a doctor would like to get from you through a mobile phone. We have a, uh, the, one of the largest derma libraries in the world uh, that has just received medical approval in Europe through the CE mark 
to be able to be a, a medical diagnostic tool in Europe. We have 588 skin conditions across 133 categories. Simple photograph through your mobile phone of the lesion, the mark, the rash. It analyzes it on device and gives you back what, it, what the AI is saying that it is. Well, that is that assists you to triage care to your dermatologist, say, hey, this is what the AI is telling me this is, and um, do I need to come in and see or do I just go and get some cream from the pharmacy? So we yeah. have those. We have a muscular mortal assessment tool. So when you're looking at gait, motion, mobility, stability and strength, we're able to map that through a video capture through the mobile phone and it analyzes on device. And it, if there are, it scores the movements a person does that are selective movements and it tells them what they would need to do to improve that flexibility, stability, strength through those movements. And, and, you know, it's great for the elderly because, you know, the mobility in the elderly is something that they lose over time but don't notice. So having a scoring system like this that they do for two minutes once a week to get a score yeah. back and then it gives them suggestions on what to do. But it's also being used by college football teams in the US and the US military and so on because musculoskeletal assessment because of those packs and the way they they have right. impact and so on. It's so important to be able to understand. And then the last piece of the puzzle, and I'm going in too deep, is we have an ability through a company out of Boston that we've partnered with that have a little Bluetooth dongle for blood tests where they send it out, comes out with a number of blood strips and a micro pricking device, and you put a little bit of blood on a strip and into this device and it does an analysis of 15 different biomarkers around chronic disease, um, heart risk, stroke, and so on. So we really, what we're doing is, and why we've become advanced human imaging is because all these organisations, whether they're insurers, care providers, wellness companies, or that blurred lines between fitness and wellness companies now, are trying to be able to assist in better health outcomes for consumers. And to do that, most of the time, it's driven from self-reported data. Someone says, this is what my waistline is, or this is what my weight is, or so on. What we do is we actually give them real-time data that's not self-reported and we give them the ability to do that often at a very low cost to be able to have longitudinal diagnostics of their, their position of their health and be utilising that with their ongoing care so that you can intervene before an event and we're trying to get rid of that episodic care where something goes wrong so you can go to the doctor rather than right. identify those markers 6, 12, 18 months before the event so that you can you can see the risk profiles increasing through the data, and it tells you what to do. Right. No, it's interesting. So that's you know, so this, it's long, it's not long winded. He's got a lot a lot of pieces in there, and you anticipated one of my next questions about healthy aging. I want to ask about smartphones because you know you talked about how all these things are on your on your mobile device, and I, I guess it's a stretch to say, but you, you mentioned you've got your whole database on your mobile phones. So maybe the idea came from there. Certainly one of the areas where there's been advances and basis of competition across smartphones has been on the camera side of things. And I wonder in terms of what you're doing, you know, how much of the more advanced things that you have are enabled by these cameras, that these phones that have three cameras on them and, and, and so on. Has that made a big difference or you sort of your most basic original iPhone can do most of what you need? So what, our technology can be supported as far back as the Apple 7 phone. So we, we support any device that Apple still supports. So we make sure our functionality is, is compatible. The difference that you get, and that, that is equal on Android, anything from a five-year-old Android forward, um, we can operate on. So those two systems have, have no resistance for us. Where the nexus point is, where that inflection point of change and capability comes in is not the camera because the camera has been a very important part of the mobile phone for a very long time. People yeah. use these things to map their life now, whether it's been that avocado on toast in the morning or the new car you just bought. You know, we, we have these social media lives that we want. We need good photos. So the cameras on these phones have been very good, res like you know, five, five pixel, megapixel and yeah. so on for many, many, many years. Where our functionality really becomes advanced is now when you're looking at the the GPU and the CPU and the, the machine learning chips that have been put on these phones yeah. that drive the functionality. In our early days, we needed to use the cloud because the compute power that we needed needed to happen in the cloud on service. These mobile phones now can do it on device and not only do it on device in 
a faster time than you can reach for the phone to look at the the yeah. information. It can't even get to the cloud and back that fast. So it, it is it's fantastic what these things are doing. So that's the difference that's really if you like transitioned us over the years is we've gone from a through device in cloud return data give it back process to be an on device capturing system. The, there are some pieces we do in the cloud, but it does it on the fly from the phone while it's gathering from you and it brings it back. So there wouldn't be any of our sequences that take more than one minute. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other the other thing that the, 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 another thing that's nice about what what you're describing there and, and utilizing that the local you know, there's been a big talk about the cloud, but the, the advantage of everybody having these powerful computers in, in their pocket is, of course, then that's also the, the, the cost of the processing and so on is, is going on, on on the phone, which people already have, as opposed to, you know, the scale that you're talking about. You can do all that on the cloud. It's there's performance issues, but it's also becomes expensive. So it's you leveraging the technology that's actually out in people's pockets. We did a little calculation on that recently where we, we were trying to sort of work out cost of goods and um, we, we did a calculation that we could take an avatar of every person on the planet and um, store it for a month. It would cost us $1,800 yeah, okay. if we stored it on the cloud. You know, yeah. Because we do it on device. So your data is on your device because you're keeping it for yourself. If it's yeah. been supplied by you, by, let's say Blue Shield or one of these organisations, you will when they supply it to you in the T's and C's, you agree to share the data with them so they can take better care of you. So that that's that that nice blending of how it's used, but none of that data storage or transition is on our side. It's all right. on their side. Let's talk about privacy and security because it's an important issue, and you feature it quite prominently on your site. How do you think about the issues and how you deal with those? First of all, and I've said it a few times, we're on device, so nothing personally identifiable through any of our processes leaves the mobile phone. Even when we do the transdermal video imaging of the face, it, it, the imaging and video is processed on device and we only send out the capture sequence of the pulse. That's all that goes to the cloud. So there's nothing that says that's Vlado. It is not tagged in any way. It's encrypted and it's brought back to the phone and it's deleted from the, the cloud process once it's been returned to you. When the images are taken through the scans of the body scanning on the phone, they're actually deleted throughout the process over that 0.5 of a second and deleted and the avatar is created with the data around it and it's given back. If they're not in your phone image section, they're not stored on the device in any way, it's, it, they're completely um, deleted. You know, so it's really important because I think you're doing all the all the right sort of things. And, and these are the sort of things that are needed to build trust, especially as people get more sophisticated and there's more data that's out there that's, uh, that, you know, that, that's serious. And I think about what you just described there in terms of deleting these images and so on on the phone is important because somebody might pick it up. But also what you've seen with this recent, uh, you know, zero day, zero click exploit against Apple is that someone is actually able to go on the phone, and even if you've done everything right. You know, they can still see everything that you can see. And the only way to deal with that is not to have things on the phone that you don't want there. So I'm quite impressed with, uh, you know, what you just described there. So I know it's a healthcare podcast, yeah, but we, talk a little security. Yeah, no, and, and one of the reasons we we you know, we had moved ourselves off the cloud um, outside of the fact that mobile phones have advanced so much was when the whole Cambridge Analytica thing happened. Yeah. What, what ended up happening around the world was... Um, GDPR changed this personal yeah. data um, side of things. Just the laws became so much stricter and enforced with enormous fines. We thought, you know what, we just don't want to be in that risk at all. So we ported everything to device so that it's in the consumer's hand. And the consumer agrees to share the data with the provider, not us. So even, yeah. even when we supply that capability to an insurer, or a fitness application, we, we give them the SDKs to embed inside their data hosting network. So it's still not coming back to us. The only thing we do is tokenize an event so we're able to understand from an audit perspective what the company owes us at the end of a period for functionality use. And outside of that, we don't know whether it was Bill, Bob or Paul that used it or where he was using it. We just know it came from that partner and that's it. That's all we know. So where does the head, where does the business head next, and uh, what are the challenges? Listen, the challenges are daily. So um, you know, the guys listening to the podcast won't be able to see me, but you can. 
uh, I'm 25 years old, but you think I was 50, right? Because the, yeah. the challenges are every day. But, yeah. um, on a more serious note, I think that the uh, difference between getting there and hoping to get there is you take those challenges on and you go after them. We're in the, the closing moments of starting to take this company onto the NASDAQ as we speak. And um, we've been listed on the Australian Stock Exchange now for six years. Two of those years, we're the highest performing tech company um, for return to shareholders in those two years. And you know, we thought, well, what do we do next? So I suppose the next challenge is we, we want to get seriously embedded in the US market where the kind of thing we do is embraced and there are just a, a plethora of companies that need this, this capability and functionality. And alongside that, just as important, is the investment community in the US that would want to be involved in an opportunity like this is so much larger than the Australian market from you know, the fund managers and the bankers and, and the mum and dad investors as well. So we're really looking forward to becoming not, not only an American domiciled company, but actually being able to deliver this capability to the US. I, I see that as a huge challenge. Are we moving key management team and, and the business to the US? We're taking this to a NASDAQ IPO and we're going to take the company to the next level. So yeah, we've got you know, definitely great vision for the company and we're going to come over there and see if we can execute as well in a market 10 times the size. Yeah, well, come on over here and come over to Boston. It sounds like you have a partner here anyway. We'll uh, we'll show you around and uh, we, 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 have a few body, we have a few bodybuilders yeah, here as well. So good. So final question is about whether you have any time for any, uh, any books or other kind of reading material, anything you would recommend to our listeners. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to brag about all these wonderful books that I've read, um, but I, I'm not not really that big on reading. I, I don't mind a good podcast, and I I certainly like a good audio book. And I was chatting to a, a really good mate of mine yesterday, and he was telling me how he'd been reading a book called Winning, which is by Tim Grover. And he said you've got to read this book because he said when I read this book about how this guy went from one win to the next because he's already projecting into what he's going to do next. He said, all I could think about was you. So that's actually the next book I'm going to read or I'm going to say listen to because yeah. I actually want to see you know, what it was that just had him so entrenched in, in reading it because he told me all about it. So that, that is my next book on my list. Outstanding. Well, Vlado Bozanak, CEO of Advanced Human Imaging and many other things along the way. I want to say thank you very much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. David, absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me along. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, President of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.